Welcome to Northgate Bible Chapel Online. Thanks for checking out our podcast, where you can listen to our latest sermons, filled with teaching, encouragement, and hope from God's Word. So whether you're outdoors, in the car, or just poured some coffee, let's dive in to today's message. Good morning. It's a wonderful singing. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here this morning to uh, just bring the Word, word of God, uh, to op- op- open the Word of God. Turn with me, if you would, this morning to Malachi chapter 3. While I was grabbing coffee, a brother told me, uh, brother, do you think you need to fill, fill the cup up that much uh, right before you speak, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, last week our brother Isaac was like uh, looking to which clock to decide. I was like, oh, maybe uh, we need to go by central time. Uh, <laughs> not Pacific time, but central time, you know. So there you go. Uh, see where the Lord leads today. So Malachi chapter 3. I was um, very thrilled this morning during our worship time uh, and definitely saw the spirit of the Lord leading into this message. Uh, in, in Psalm 10, we were reading about the injustices of the world, and that is exactly where we are today in Malachi chapter 3. Um, and at the end, uh, in the, uh, almost towards the middle of uh, Psalm 10, uh, there is this uh, claim to the Lord God of heaven, Arise, O God, arise! O God, lift up your hand, do not forget the humble. And then towards the end of that psalm, there's a transition. It's like a, as though the psalmist has seen the light. And it ends with, the Lord is king forever. And ever the nations have perished out of his hand, uh, out of the land. The Lord, Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their hearts. You will cause your ear to hear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, the man of the, that man of the earth may oppress no more. Uh, so Malachi chapter 3, and uh, we will read uh, 1 to 12 today, and that's where the Lord would have us be today. Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. And like launderer's soap, he will sit as a refiner and purify, a, a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near you for judgment and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against uh, perjurers, against those who exploit wage earn, uh, wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien, because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, in what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all your tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. 
and I will rebuke the devourers for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the wine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer once more. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for uh, the Savior who came uh, to redeem us out of every lawless deed and to purify us to be a people that would glorify you, that would sing praises to you. And Father, help us as we uh, look in hope and expectation to your second coming. Uh, and as we open this uh, word this morning, that you would enlighten our minds and encourage our hearts and enable for us uh, to see who you are and what you desire of us as we await your coming. We give you thanks for your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and in his matchless and precious name we pray. Amen. So last week, Isaac looked uh, at Malachi chapter 2, verse 10 to 17, and there we saw God calling the nation of Israel out for faithlessness, faith, uh, you know, for their lack of faith or f them treating their marriage covenant faithlessly. Uh, they were committing physical adultery, but their physical adultery was as a result of their spiritual adultery that they had committed uh, already. Uh, we also covered uh, how it applies to us today, uh, how we are to honor the Lord in our marriages, and uh, how he does not set the bar low in the New Testament, but rather higher. Uh, he sets the bar higher in that he says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Uh, that is a tall order. And how can we achieve it? The simple answer is we cannot achieve it in our, our own selves. It is God who does the work in us, in and through us, and enables for us to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Now Malachi's attention moves uh, from the depths of man's sin, so from chapter 1 and chapter 2, very, very grim, right? But it ends up in a glorious picture here of the Lord's coming. Uh, Isaac also had this phrase, don't let the evil that is around you blind you. Uh, when we are discouraged by sin that is around us, uh, the best thing that our hearts and your hearts can do is to be satisfied in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the glories of the advent of Christ Jesus as we are doing today, uh, leading into uh, uh, Christmas Day, uh, remembering the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what a beautiful a mindset it is to just rejoice in not just his advent in him coming in times past for us to redeem us, but also in his future coming. Uh, his coming uh, and the stable uh, that we partook of today reminds us of, the us of the fact that he has not yet come, but he will come to receive us unto himself. So when we see the evil that is around us, uh, take courage in the fact uh, that he is coming, uh, and we will be with him. In the end of chapter 2, uh, and uh, right before we get into Malachi chapter 3, in the end of chapter 2, there is a question that is posed by the Israelites. Uh, there is a question that is posed uh, by the nation of Israel against God. And this is a question that he has. Where is the God of justice? Where is the God of justice? They see all this evil that is around them. Uh, they see all the wickedness that is around them. And they are like, God, you're not doing anything about it. By the way, uh, not just the fact that you're not doing anything about it, they are prospering. And if they are prospering and you're not doing anything about it, then maybe you're approving of what they're doing. And maybe you take delight in that, Lord. Where is the God of justice? And that is where we end chapter 2. This is a temptation that we can face today as well as we live in this world, uh, isn't it not? Uh, looking at the ungodliness that is around us, uh, 
it is hard for us to uh, live in this wicked world. Uh, uh, you work hard in college uh, and try to do your best. You might have a friend next to you who is an atheist who curses God, but he ends up getting a 4.0 GPA and uh, you end up barely passing your classes. Like, why is it so hard? Why are they prospering and why am I not? Is the age old question that man has. Uh, why the evil around the world? Now God answers his people in Malachi's time uh, in verse one with this. Behold, I sent my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, the Lord of hosts. There are uh, three individuals in this one verse. Uh, the first one is behold I. And who is the I that is mentioned here? Uh, latter part of this verse explains who that I is. Behold, he is coming, says who? The Lord of hosts. Uh, the Lord of the armies, Jehovah of the armies of heaven is the word that is used there for the Lord of hosts. Uh, this is God the Father. It is God who initiates in sending his messenger uh, to the earth uh, to, to prepare the way, so to speak. It is God who initiates. It is God who always has moved first. Uh, has always moved first and will continue to move first. Behold I. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13, and we will be there multiple times today uh, in, in the will of the Lord. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do. It's not just me creating my own will, but it is God who does his work in me and enables for me to follow him, to love my wife as I should lo love her, uh, to enable for us to uh, persevere on in this wicked world. So God sends his messenger, he acts first. Now who is this messenger? Uh, the messenger that is being talked about here is John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 11, you can, in all of the gospels, uh, there is the reference to this messenger that would come. And uh, the, the main task that John the Baptist had was to clear the way for the coming of the savior. And that was what he had to do. You know, in times past when uh, the king would uh, come into the city, uh, they had to make sure that all the stones were moved, uh, the path was clear, uh, there were no uh, people that would come in, into the way, there would be protections that are set aside, barriers, so that the king's pathway would be made clear for him to come. And if there were any obstructions, that they would be removed. And that was the intention and the purpose of John the Baptist being said, sent ahead of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will prepare the way or clear the way. And for references, we are not going to look there. You can look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 76. Or you can look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 10 and 11. You can look at Luke chapter 7, uh, verse 26 to 28. And in all these instances, you will see the messenger, John the Baptist. He prepared the way. And what did he do in preparing the way? What was his message? His message was that of repentance. Uh, the, the stumbling stones that were in front of the Israelites, uh, the stumbling stones uh, that they encountered in their lives in chapter 1 and 2 of Malachi uh, required uh, them to repent of what they were doing. It is God who used vessels uh, like John the Baptist to prepare the way. So there's a question that uh, you might want to just think about for yourself as well. When we see the evil and injustices in this world, uh, what is your response and what is my response to those in injustices? Do we mock the mockers? Do we scoff the scoffers? Do we retribute evil for evil? And it is very easy to do those things. 
but our rightful response to the evil and the injustices that are around us is to preach Christ Jesus and to preach him as crucified for their sins, for our sins. And that is our role today. God sent his messenger to prepare the way for the coming of the Savior. And he is coming again to take us unto himself. And we are ambassadors, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And that is the message that the church has to give to the world that is lost and dying rather than the mocking, the mockers are scoffing the scoffers. We are messengers. And again, you might say, but I don't have the words. I'm not able to do this. And that is where the first verse uh, the first word of this uh, chapter comes in, behold the eye. It is not me, but rather it is God who does that. The effectiveness of you being used by the Lord as a messenger or as an ambassador has little to do with your abilities and everything to do with his power and greatness. It doesn't depend on your strength and striving, but on your willingness to let him use you as he did John the Baptist. Proceeding on, uh, we see in that verse one, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord. Uh, the Lord uh, that is being used there, Adonai, the mighty one, uh, in this reference is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the first time that the Lord Jesus Christ came, did he come in judgment? He did not come in judgment. He did not come to administer perfect justice. He did not come to condemn the world. He came as savior and not as a judge. He came to save and not in judgment. In John chapter three and verse 17, uh, we read, uh, God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, if he came and administered perfect justice, uh, as we were reading uh, today, I, I, I forget, the, uh, probably it was John chapter 17 or 20, um, or maybe even in Luke in the first half of the meeting, where the sons of thunder uh, were standing before the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, you know, wipe away uh, these people who are, uh, you know, who are against you, Lord. And what would the Lord say? He wouldn't condemn them. Uh, he, he came to save them, not to destroy them. He did not come in judgment the first time. He came to bring forth life and life more abundantly. So this um, Lord whom you seek suddenly that will come into the temple is speaking of a future day when our Lord Jesus Christ will come and there will be peace on earth as we read in Revelation chapter 20 uh, earlier today. God's justice for our sin was satisfied uh, on this, by the Savior on the cross. We received mercy and not judgment. If he had come the first time, and if he were to have executed perfect justice, we wouldn't be here today. But instead, he came in mercy he did not, he came in grace. He did not give us what we so justly deserved and that was death. So this picture here uh, is of the Lord Jesus Christ finally coming uh, to judge sin. Now again, I, I, I can't help but uh, think about practical implications of all these things for us today individually and us pers uh, and, and also as an assembly. Whenever we think of the evil that is in the world, uh, we always, uh, what is the first thing that gravitates in your mind? The first thing that comes into your mind. Uh, you think of all these evil things that are going on in the world. You think of the atro atrocities that were committed. 
uh, by, uh, are being committed by men. You think of evil people like Nero in the Roman Empire, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. You think of Hitler uh, in Germany. You think of uh, Putin or Putin alikes uh, today in Russia. You think of all these people that are committing all kinds of atrocities and evil. But the question is this, what about the evil that is in us? What about the evil that is in me? That is what people don't want to judge today. Uh, when the, the children of Israel were telling the Lord uh, that there were all these evil that were going around about him and he was being blinded to their evilness, they were forgetting how evil they were. They were forgetting uh, their sinfulness and the atrocities that they had committed against the Lord God of heaven in breaking every single commandment that was in the book. Paul rightly would say in Romans chapter 7, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 would say, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who? Who can know it? And then God would respond saying, I the Lord search the heart and I test the minds. We are capable of the worst. We are capable of the worst of the worst uh, just like all these people that we just referenced. So we judge ourselves of the sins that are in our lives. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, we read, Therefore let him who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And I have to time and again remind myself of this. Um, or else we are going to be in the same boat as the people in Malachi's time. So the messenger of the covenant will come. Uh, and uh, we read that they were seeking him, but uh, they were seeking him without faith. They were delighting in the coming of his day. Uh, and you can uh, read at, at your leisure, Amos chapter 5 and verse 18. Uh, they were delighting in the coming of his day, but they did not understand that the coming of the day of the Lord would implicate them of what they were doing. The messenger of the covenant will come. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 we read, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, uh, we read like this, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief. Very similar to the passage that we just read in Malachi. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Suddenly, immediately, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Every evil deed, every sinful atrocity that is committed in the world today will be dealt with by the wrath of God when he comes. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, in verse 11 of 2 Peter chapter 3, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? The question to the church today. If this is what is going to happen, uh, how ought we to be as a church? in reverence and godliness and in fear and holy conduct of the one and in, in giving ourselves to the one who gave himself up for us. He committed all judgment to his son, we read in John chapter 5 and verse 22. The father judges no one, but the son, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he will judge the world. All evil will be judged. Now, verse 2, he is like a refiner's fire, like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purify, a purifier of silver, and he will purify who? The sons of Levi. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, we read of purification in three aspects. We read of it in water, 
uh, as with the leper, we read of it with fire, we read of it with the blood. Without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And when we look at this passage here, uh, there are two aspects that are mentioned. There is the launderer's soap, there is water, uh, and there is fire, uh, the refiner who sits uh, under the heat of the fire, refining the gold, uh, removing the dross, but there is no blood that is mentioned here. Uh, there is no mention of blood in this passage because the cleansing uh, by his blood was accomplished at his first coming. There is a, a coming day when this, you know, when all uncleanness, when Levi or talking about Israel, talking about uh, the people during Malachi's time, talking about Israel, the unbelieving nation today, they will be purified. They will be purified, they will be cleansed, and they will see God for who he is, and they will realize that they had missed the Messiah. They were blinded by the things that were around them that they missed the Messiah. In Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1 we read, in that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. God will deal with them and he will purify them. And now what is the purpose of all this? What is the purpose of the, the silver being refined, the gold being refined, uh, the smelter uh, putting the heat on uh, the object uh, so that they would offer an offering to the Lord in righteousness is what we read. That they would offer in righteousness. An offering in righteousness. The only way for an offerer to offer an offering in righteousness is to have his heart be right and declared right by God by his grace and through faith in Jesus Christ. There is no other way uh, for us to offer an offering to the Lord that is right uh, without coming to Christ. So again, going into a little more of an application for us today as a church, what are our offerings? Uh, the offerings for the Old Testament saints, we know of, of all those offerings. But all those offerings pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, as the blood bought saints, uh, we have offerings too uh, to bring to the Lord. Uh, and it's not just bringing an offering to the Lord, but it is how we bring the offering to the Lord that matters. Because we read later on, I think it is verse 6, where he says, I am the Lord and I do not change. He is the God of the Old Testament and he is the same God today. So what are our offerings? Our lives, I would say. Our lives. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. You don't have to turn there. Very familiar verses. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, or which is your spiritual worship. And it goes on to say in verse 2, but do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or that you may test uh, and discern what the will of God is and what is good and acceptable and perfect in the sight of God. So our lives are an offering to God. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. And how can we do that in this world? By conforming not to the things that you see and read on the news today, and not to the world philosophies, but rather submitting ourselves to the one uh, and the, uh, the word of God and submitting and not just submitting, but obeying uh, him who provides us his word. Presenting our bodies, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Uh, the word that is used there is metamorphosis. Uh, it is something uh, that is so ugly that ends up being beautiful. Uh, and we can do that only by his power. By the renewing of your mind, there is an intentional renewing by his spirit uh, that works in us so that our bodies can be used for his kingdom and for his glory in whatever way that he would want us to be or whatever way he would want us to offer. Uh, secondly, so our lives and uh, our, the second one, and, and that in itself, our lives being offered is a worship. 
uh, the second aspect of worship, uh, the sacrifices of praise, an offering of praise. And, and that is what we did this morning uh, at the Lord's Supper, offered up the sacrifices of praise to God in the remembrance of what he has done for us on the cross. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, we read, Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips acknowledging his name. That is what the people in Malachi's time, that is what they did not do. They did not revere his name. They did not acknowledge his name. But we, through our sacrifices of praise, acknowledge and revere his name. So those are the offerings uh, for us as New Testament saints today. Our bodies, uh, our worship, our worship, our praises uh, through our mouth. Now again, uh, I want to dig a little more deeper into this. Uh, the offerings of righteousness. Uh, as I mentioned prior, it's not just offering uh, to the Lord, but it is how we offer to the Lord that matters as well. Um, the Israelites offered, but they offered unacceptable offerings. God was not pleased with their offerings. Their offerings uh, were unacceptable because of sin that indwelled in them and their unconfessed and unrepentant sins that were in their lives. How different it is, is it for us today as we come to worship him? You know, one of the things that I have observed uh, through my years uh, in the assemblies is, um, or you know, not just in the assemblies, when I go to worship the Lord, it is the hours leading to going to worship my Savior that is the most trying and testing times that I've ever had. Uh, because I know that Satan is at work deeply uh, to captivate my mind and to take my mind away from Christ Jesus, for whom I'm going to offer. Uh, might have had a rough Saturday, might have lost it in your anger against your kids, um, might have said something that hurt your wife, uh, must not have dealt lovingly and uh, in care uh, with her. Uh, you might have offended a brother or a sister in Christ by sending uh, him or her a nasty gram by email or messenger or whatever. And then after all that, you just come at peace on a Sunday morning to offer up praises to God. Is that an acceptable offering to God? Uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, and, and it's important that we understand these concepts. Uh, it's not just our offerings, but it is how we offer it, an offering in righteousness, and it is very important to the heart of God. In Matthew chapter 5, and verse 23, we read like this. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. There is no fluff there. It's very, very clearly stated by the Lord Jesus himself. Deal with the sin or the offense that has come before you before you offer an offering to me. When we sin against someone, uh, whether it's in our words or in our works or in our attitude, uh, deal with that sin first and then co come and worship the Lord and offer an offering in righteousness. Uh, Isaac looked at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 last, uh, last week, uh, where that your prayers may not be hindered. Uh, in Psalm 66 and verse 18, we read, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. It will not be an acceptable offering. And the solution to all this is to confess your sins before the Lord. Confess your sins one to another to the one that you have offended, and be ye reconciled. Uh, unto the Lord and unto your brother before you come. Uh, there's also the aspect of self-examination. So now you know that there is an offense, but there's also an aspect of self-examination that is required for the believer. Um, in, in, a, in 
in, in the Corinthian church, that was a problem. Uh, there was a problem there where they were not, they were coming to the Lord for worshiping the Lord, but their uh, mind was being captivated by different things. Um, in, in Psalm chapter 24 and verse 3 and 4, we read, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, uh, or who may stand in his holy place, he who has clean hands and a pure hand, uh, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, uh, or sown deceitfully, who has not lifted up his hands uh, to an idol. If there is any idol that you want to think of today, it is yourself, it is me. So in the Corinthian church, uh, in uh, chapter 11, and you don't have to turn there, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, they were coming to break bread. They were coming to observe the Lord's table. Uh, and this is what the Lord had to tell them. Uh, in verse 29, he who eats and drinks uh, in an unworthy manner drinks and eats judgment to himself. They were coming and eating and partaking of the Lord's table. They were offering to the Lord, but their offerings were in unrighteousness rather than in righteousness. The Lord desires righteous offerings. And he will purge, he will purify like a refiner's fire, uh, whether it be through weakness, whether it be through sickness, uh, whatever it is, so that we would be a people that would glorify him and offer righteous offerings. Uh, in first, first John chapter 1 and verse 9 we read, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all our transgressions or all our unrighteousness. Proceeding to verse 6. Malachi 3, for I am the Lord, I do not change, therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Man changes. Uh, oh, the sin that is in us that gets the best of us versus the Lord having the best of us. Man changes, but there is one thing that remains constant, and that is our Savior. He is the same as today, today, and forever. He does not change. I love that song by... Uh, by the artist Hannah Kerr, the same God who makes the seasons change, knows the numbers of the s stars, uh, every secret in my heart, all my doubts, all my questions, and every fear I have about what might happen. You are the same God. You are with me in the middle of it all. God, you are catching every tear as it falls. I know you'll never change. Even when I'm feeling far away, you love me the same, God. Love me the same. And that is the message that he has in verse 7 for his people. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. And the word return that is used there, in, uh, uh, that is the Hebrew uh, <coughs> for returning to the Lord, is, uh, and, and the Greek uh, for that same word there is to turn back or coming back to a place or condition or activity uh, that you had experienced before of fullness, of wholeness, of a right relationship with God. God wants his people who are far off and in rebellion with him uh, to come wholeheartedly in submission to the one who saved them. The Lord is mighty to save. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, that we keep asking ourselves is why has God not yet come? Uh, why is God not dealing with the justices yet as the messenger of the covenant that would one day come? Why is he delaying? He is delaying because we read in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. It's not that he does not want to come sooner. He does want to come and dwell with us. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness or slackness but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He wants all to return to him, and he promises that he would restore and reconcile and make whole. And that is why he is delayed today. Jumping to verse eight. Uh, in verse eight, we see uh, man again, so uh, going and, you know, the implications continue. 
you know, God implicating uh, his people saying they have robbed God. They have robbed God. And the people are being very agnostic. They're like, in what way have you robbed you? They were being very indifferent. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, they were seeing all the sins that were around them, but they were not seeing the sins that were inherently within them. They were robbing God, and they were robbing gods of tithes and offerings. In the Levitical times, uh, there were tithes. The word tithe that is used there is a tenth. Uh, tithes that were to be given uh, to the Levites because they did not have an inheritance. Uh, there was, this was a mandatory offering. This was like a tax that the children of Israel had to pay, uh, just like we pay taxes today. But that was for the nation, for uh, the Levites for the people that were in service of God. But beyond all the mandatory offerings, there were also involuntary, voluntary, uh, voluntary offerings or free will offerings. There was the burnt offerings, there were the um, gift offerings or the meal offerings, there were the peace offerings. These were all things that the people would come voluntarily and as a result of the peace that they have in their heart because of what God has accomplished, they would come and offer to the Lord freely. They would offer the burnt offering wherein everything would be consumed uh, all for him uh, in an act of worship. Uh, free will offerings. And God implicates them here saying, you have not given me my mandatory offerings to sustain my people, the Levites, the priests at the temple, wherein there is no, no food even in the temple. And secondly, you have not given to me even the offerings. They have robbed God. They have robbed God. And how does this apply to us today in the New Testament church as well? What about our giving of our substance? And again, uh, Isaac touched upon this very briefly, wherein, uh, you know, everything that we have today is that which is from the Lord, and we are just giving back to him. Uh, in the New Testament, there is no concept of tithing, so to speak. Uh, there is no one-tenth. There is no formula that is given in the New Testament with regard to giving back to the Lord. But uh, how do you give back to the Lord? You give back to the Lord... Uh, according to the measure of grace in which he has bestowed upon you, and so you give. In uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, again, Paul here in 2 Corinthians would say in verse nine, chapter 9 and verse 7, and this is going through the grace of God to the church of Macedonia, and how they were in their afflictions giving to the Lord, how they were in their poverty giving to the Lord, and then in chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians and verse 7, he would say this, so let each one of you, as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of the necessity, uh, for God loves a cheerful giver. So each one give as he purposes in his heart. There is no formula here today. The culmination of all our giving, again, as an offering unto the Lord, is because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace that he has bestowed upon us. And he ends that beautiful passage uh, of the Macedonian church and their grace uh, that they received from God and, in, and that was reflected in their giving. And he ends that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 where we read, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, yet he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might be made rich. The grace of God. The grace of God is the result of our giving to the Lord, and none other. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect one, the motivation for our giving. Do we rob God by not giving to him uh, what he so justly deserves? Uh, all of us, all of our praises, all of our finances, whatever you purpose in your heart as led by the Spirit of the Lord, are we obeying when the Spirit moves in our hearts? So God, God ends up uh, challenging the people. God ends up saying, you know, put me to the test. Put me to the test, Israelites. Put me to the test. And I will not prove you wrong. You give, you bring your tithes to me, and I will open up the floodgates of heaven 
so much so that you will not be able to contain what I provide for you in blessings, is what God would tell the people during Malachi's time. Do we need God to prove uh, to us over and over um, you know, what he deserves? Do we need God to prove himself to us again? Uh, has not God proven his immeasurable love to us in his son? Has he not proven himself to us in his patience with us? Has he not proven himself to us in his grace to us? Has he not proven himself to us in his provisions for us, both spiritually and materially? And he who has proven himself to us over and over again can be trusted for the future. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This was the message uh, to the uh, Israelites, to the people during Malachi's time. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ is coming again, and he's coming to take us unto himself, and he's coming to reign on the earth, wherein all injustices will be removed, wherein there will be peace on earth, wherein the Lord God of heaven will make his tabernacle with us, wherein there will be no death, there will be no tears, wherein we will offer up perfect sacrifices of offerings unto him without any flaw. But until then, we as a church, as messengers, as ambassadors for Christ, may we persevere looking unto him, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Praise his name. What a savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your selfless giving to us. You have given your all for us. Father God, help us to indwell in that grace. Help us to know what you have accomplished for our souls. And help us to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, fully, fully uh, yielding ourselves to you in full obedience to the one who gave himself up for us. Help us, Lord, to be ambassadors for Christ Jesus. To the world that is lost, we know us that you are a patient God, a long-suffering God, not willing that anyone should perish. Father, even so, come, Lord Jesus, until then, help us to be the people that you have called us to be, faithful unto the end. Strengthen us. Pray for these dear brothers and sisters in Christ here. Help us, Lord, to be people uh, that would offer up to you, that, that we would uh, proclaim Christ Jesus and him crucified to the world, that we would deal with our own sins in our own lives. First, and come before you in, 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 with clean hands. Father, we thank you for your provisions that you have for us in Christ Jesus. We need none other, the perfect one who gave himself up. We give you thanks for him, and in Jesus Christ, most precious, and his matchless and precious name we pray. Amen.